Hello, this is Yeshua Said My Name. In this video, we are going to be discussing the Catholic doctrine of the Eucharist or the sacrifice of the Mass and how that has ties to the pagan origins of Egyptian mythology. And most pagan religions, back when it was said that the gods or the heavenly host visited earth, they also brought with them a doctrine uh, that I, one of the most familiar that I want to relate to is the doctrine of uh, eating of one's God. Um, and I'm going to take us to uh, the Egyptian practice of the so-called god Osiris and how many practiced what they believe was eating their god and thereby taking the divine energy into themselves. And one of the reasons that the modern day Roman Catholic Church or the Va Vatican City State in Revelation 17 is called Mystery Babylon is because she cloaks herself with an outward godly appearance, claiming the name of Christ while practicing pagan religions and incorporating those pagan religious practices and uh, ecumenical affiliations with these uh, groups of people. There's a couple of articles that I'm going to read to you from here. Uh, I will put links down in the description section for you so you can look into them yourself. Uh, the first one I'm going to read from, actually, it, it's a question that I want to pose to you to think about. Is Jesus, this secular article is saying, a retelling of the Osiris mythology. So what is the Osiris mythology and what does it have to do with transubstantiation and the Eucharist? Well, the Lord calls Mystery Babylon or Modicum Vatican City State uh, paganistic. She's Babylon. And in Babylon, it was purely paganistic rituals and uh, religious practices, one of which was supposedly eating one's God in order to take divine energy into yourself. Now, during the mass, Catholics say uh, they call it transubstantiation, where they believe that the Pope or a priest can stand at the altar and literally command the energy or, or power of God to come down into that wafer and transform it into the literal body and blood of Christ. Therefore, when the participant eats that wafer, they believe, as they are taught by false Catholic doctrine, which this is not scriptural, that they are literally taking Christ into themselves. This is what they believe means having Christ live in you, or being born again. Jesus spoke to the leaders of his day, and I want you to hear this fully if you're unfamiliar with this. Jesus told them, your forefathers ate manna in the desert and they died. Jesus was telling them, do not believe simply because you practice a ritual or partake in this, this symbolism of, of you taking me in you, that this is what gives you eternal life. Christ said, do this in remembrance of me. It is an outward expression of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. When Christ rose from the dead, ascended back to the Father, he gave his spirit to live in us. This is what Jesus meant when he said, uh, if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have life in you. He was not talking about a literal piece of bread being transformed into a Christ-like energy and then you taking that energy into yourself. This is a doctrine of the fallen angels that came as the gods and taught the ancients to do such things. This is not what Christ was talking about. Uh, as a matter of fact, most of what is taught about uh, these issues on this channel has to be discerned by the Holy Spirit. The scripture tells us that the man, with, the man or woman without the Spirit of God will not understand the things of the Spirit for they are spiritually discerned. So some of the things that I'm presenting on this channel, unless the Holy Spirit gives someone revelation to, they're, they're just going to think it's conspiracy theory. However, when the Holy Spirit opens your eyes to understand that these rituals that are practiced came from pagan origins, you will your whole life will be transformed, Lord willing. And this is what I pray for. So this uh, secular article that I'm reading from, and I'll read another uh, portion of a secular article. And the reason I give secular sources at times is to show that this is not coming simply from a born again Christian point of view, but from a secular source as well, proving the point that I believe the Lord is trying to make through me uh, on this subject. Is Jesus simply a retelling of the Osiris mythology? Now, this is what the modern Vatican City state, or even hundreds of years ago, the Vatican City has been doing in their practice of transubstantiation with the Eucharist, the sacrifice of the mass, where they re-sacrifice Christ over and over and over again. The one sacrifice for our sins was made on the cross. It does not have to be repeated over and over again at the mass. 
It said Christ died once for all. When he was on the cross, he said it is finished. There is no need for a repeated sacrifice at an altar. The Getting back to the Eucharist, this eating of one's God where the participant is fed the Eucharist by a priest, which in some Catholic churches today, and I know this is changing, they weren't even allowed to touch the wafer. The wafer had to be handed to them on a, on a pallet or a spoon and put in their mouth by the priest. If it dropped on the floor, it was considered you know, blasphemy because you're dropping literally the transubstantiated wafer onto the ground, which they thought literally contained the body and blood of Christ. Now, this is uh, has its roots. This practice of eating one's God has its roots. And I'm going to take you to another article that I read here um, of eating one's God uh, and taking that divine energy into yourself. Now, uh, the mystery of the Eucharist, and I'm, I'm reading to you from, this is a um, um, from a Christian website. The final article I'll read to you from is actually from a se another secular website, and I'll explain that in a moment. Of all the ancient dogmas of the Roman Catholic religion, the dogma of transubstantiation is the most wicked and satanic. It is at the very heart of Romanism, the key to so-called sacrifice of the mass. Transubstantiation is Rome's most lucrative, powerful, and fixed dogma. Certainly it is her, notice the her, the the um, the opposite of the bride of Christ, a her or a woman in Bible prophecy is always referred to as a church. It is her most effective control device for the perpetuation of her gigantic corporation whose existence is maintained by sacraments administered by a supposedly divinely empowered priesthood. Now, all of the priests in the Catholic Church call themselves an altar Christos, another Christ. The very title of the papacy, Vicarious Fili Dei, means in place of the Son of God on earth, meaning God on earth. All of the pharaohs, all of the religious leaders, and whether it was with the Mayans, the Aztecs, the Incas, they all had these priests that were said to have divine lineage or the very leaders themselves were considered to be gods on earth. This is no different with the papal line. In the book of Daniel, it was prophesied that the dynasty of the papacy would claim to be God on earth. And I've done videos on this in the past. So please digress and take a look at those. The pagan origin of the doctrine of transubstantiation does not date back to the Last Supper as is supposed. It was a controvert—I'm um, sorry—a controverted topic for many centuries before officially becoming an article of the faith of the Catholic doctrine. So this dates back. What they're getting back to here in this article are the pagan origins of this transubstantiation. So if you look up paganism and transubstantiation, or ancient Egypt and transubstantiation, or uh, the Eucharist and Osiris, and you look this up, uh, you'll be amazed what you come across. This is all taken from ancient pagan uh, practice, and this is where the Lord nicknames this harlot church Babylon the Great. It's basically, uh, trying. she's trying to cloak herself with an outward appearance of godliness, but practicing pagan religions and incorporating them. Is that not what the papacy has been doing for years aligning themselves ecumenically with pagan religions and doctrines all over the world? Of course. Um, the pagan origin. So it's saying here, the idea of a corporeal presence was vaguely held by some, such as Ambrose, but was not until 831 AD that Passius Robertus, a Benedictine monk, published a tristus openly advocating the doctrine of transubstantiation. Even then, for almost another 400 years, theological wars were waged over this teaching by bishops and people alike until the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215 AD. It was officially defined and canonized as a dogma. All right. So this belief that one's God can be brought down by a priest or a pope into the Eucharist was established in 1215 AD, and this dogma has held strong since. Like many of the beliefs and rites of Romanism, transubstantiation was first practiced by pagan religions, which is what I was just saying. Um, and it goes on back to, in ancient Egypt, priests would consecrate cakes, which were supposed to become the flesh of Osiris. Now, the Lord dealt with this. In the Old Testament, he would tell the Israelites, you're baking cakes to the queen of heaven. Now, the queen of heaven, in my opinion, is none other than what people call the apparitions of the Virgin Mary that are appearing. Uh, this is demonic. They, are, th This is not Mary appearing to them. This is another attempt by 
Satan to just, uh, you know, distract people from paying attention to the one true God, the Lord Jesus Christ. So getting back to it, in Egypt, priests would consecrate the cakes, which were supposed to become the flesh of Osiris. Okay. Um, it says here, uh, da, 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 da. And it goes on to talk about back with the Aztecs and the Incas. Uh, I mean, I'll put a, a link down for you in the description section. Um, it says here, the testimony of scripture, true born again Christians who correctly interpret the word of God see without any difficulty whatsoever our Lord's reference to his body and blood that it was symbolic. When Jesus spoke of himself as being the bread, he was not teaching the fictitious transubstantiation of the papal church. It is preposterous to hold that the Son of God turned into a piece of bread himself. Now, Jesus was trying to bring home this point when he stated, your fathers ate manna in the desert and they died. He never said, he was talking about when his spirit would be given, that he would come to live in you, that your body would be the temple of the Holy Spirit. That is what it means to be born again, to have the Lord living in you and you in him. He does not mean a literal physical eating of bread. And nowhere in the scriptures does Jesus himself teach that the bread actually becomes him and that a human priest or pope has the power to call Christ down off his throne and literally inhabit a piece of bread. This is not what saves you. If this is what saves you, then the cross and Christ's finished work, his one and only sacrifice on that cross was insufficient then. So <laughs> he's saying that it represents, just like when we are baptized, okay, we are showing an outward manifestation of what has taken place on the inside. Baptism does not save you. What it does is it's showing you, a, it's a symbol of what has taken place. You are dead to the things of this world, uh, that you are now in anew in Christ. And that is what it is to represent. But many sadly have taken baptism or eating of a Eucharist or church attendance as what saves you. That is not what saves you. Um, and this final website that I'm reading from is another secular source here. It says the origins of communion or the Eucharist. And this is by Justin Taylor. Again, this person I'm reading from, he is uh, doesn't seem to know the Lord. I'm simply reading this source for you so you can get an idea of where this uh, pagan practice of transubstantiation comes from within Roman Catholicism. He goes on to say, historically, the Eucharist meaning thanksgiving and sacrifice of a God-man were well-known and well-loved by pagan mystery cults. So it's not just Romanism, okay? Centuries before the Christian cults integrated them into the Gospels. It says here, the Eucharist goes way back into history and is based upon the ritual consumption of a God-man. Osiris, Dionysus, Attis, and many others were ritually consumed. The practice dates back to prehistory when a human sacrifice was identified uh, with, with God or some type of nature of God and was sacrificed and eaten. Over the ages, human sacrifice was found detestable. Animals were then substituted in the sacrifice as the ritual identifier uh, of an offering to God. Now, we know that God had people sacrifice an animal in the Old Testament as a symbol of his coming sacrifice on the cross. The blood of animals would never wash away sin. And the scripture tells us that. It is only the perfect sacrifice, the lamb of God himself, Jesus Christ, that takes away our sin. His finished work on the cross, nothing else. But uh, these links I'll put down for you, two of which are secular, one of which is Christian. But I wanted to substantiate for you from both a Christian point of view and a secular point of view, where this doctrine of transubstantiation comes from. You know, this this practice back uh, dating into ancient Egypt still holds true today in the papal system. So not only is this papal system purporting to be God on earth like all the other pagan religions did. I mean, if you look back into ancient history, Aztecs, Mayans, you name it, they all claim that their leaders were of divine origin, that they were gods on earth. The pharaohs claimed this as well. Um, and they believed that once they died you could then perform a mystical ritual and have their essence or their divine essence put into the bread or the wafers that you were eating and take in that God into yourself. So when Jesus stated, uh, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. This is why a lot of the priests and leaders of his day wanted to stone him for blasphemy. He was not, he was not teaching paganism here. 
He was teaching when his spirit would be given to come live in us. When he rose from the dead, he breathed on the apostles and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Our bodies are now the temple of the Holy Spirit if you belong to Christ. This is what it means to take Christ into you. And Jesus said, I, in the book of Revelation, I will come into you and you will come into me and we will dine together. We will have fellowship with one another. It is all about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and having his spirit come to live in you. This doctrine that's being taught, whether you're Catholic or Protestant, that as long as I take communion or I take the Eucharist, I'm good to go because I'm actually taking Christ into myself. No, Jesus said that your forefathers ate manna in the desert and they died, spiritually and physically died. Christ alone is life. Life is found in him and only by his indwelling spirit can we live? This picture of communion is simply a symbol of the Lord's Spirit coming to live in us. No man on earth can call down Christ's power off his throne and subject him into a wafer and then feed Christ to people. This is not scriptural. People are taking out of context what God's word says. And again, I want to leave you with this thought. Scripture tells us that the person, man or woman, without the Spirit of God cannot understand the things of God. It doesn't mean they don't want to. It means they cannot. Unless God's Spirit comes to live in you and opens your eyes to these truths, you will not see this. You will not see this. And you will continue to believe that sitting in a church pew, being baptized, taking the Eucharist or communion or being on a church roll saves you. That's putting your trust in the rituals of man. Only the Lord Jesus Christ can save you. And being born again of his spirit means having his spirit come to live in you, not simply eating a Eucharist. So this transubstantiation that's going on dates back to the days of the Egyptian pharaohs, of Cyrus. Uh, look up the, the Incas and the Mayas and the Aztecs, and they, they all perform these rituals. And this is what mystery Babylon is all about. She cloaks herself with an outward appearance of Christ, looking like a lamb coming to purport to uh, speak about the Lord, but yet she's taking on all these pagan rituals into herself, marrying herself to all the pagan religions of the world, and then, and then dishing it out to people as Christianity. This is not Christianity, and this is not the scripture. So this pagan tradition of eating one's God goes all the way back to the practice of the ancient Egyptians and the Osiris, Dionysus, the Mayans, the Aztecs, the Incas, you name it, they, they've done it, uh, and many more. Uh, so I just wanted to break this down for you. Where does this come from? Where does transubstantiation come from? And even from secular sources that I just quoted you, this dates back, this idea of taking one's God by food into yourself dates back way before the Lord walked the earth. It, this is coming from pagan origins. And what Jesus was trying to tell you is that I myself will come to live in you in the person of my spirit. Not that if you eat bread, that I will come down off my throne, inhabit that piece of bread and come to live in you and now you're saved. That is not what Jesus taught. Even the priests of his day said, how can this man, Jesus, give us his flesh and blood to eat? Even they said that. So what they didn't understand was what Jesus was saying by the power of his spirit. I will put my spirit in you and you will live. I will put my spirit in you and you will be born again of my spirit. Your body will become my literal temple because my spirit will live in you. And my spirit is real bread. And you'll never hunger and thirst again. So have you been born again of Christ's spirit? Does his spirit literally live in you, your body being his temple? Or do you believe that you are fine because you sit in a church pew or because you've taken the Eucharist or communion or you've been baptized, whatever it may be? Those are all outward physical rituals that don't depend on Christ alone to save you. Something to think about, guys. Thank you for listening, and uh, more to come soon, Lord willing. God bless you today.